Welcome back to Logic Made Accessible. Now that we've gone over each of the building blocks of logic, we can go deeper into each of them. Today we're going to go into terms. A few lessons ago, we distinguished between categorigmatic and syncategorigmatic terms. In this course, we will be primarily concerned with the former. To review, a categorigmatic term is any term that designates a category of things in the world. Remember that categories are roughly collections of things with a common exclusive property. The properties are exclusive in the sense that if anything does not have a certain property, then those things are not in the category corresponding to that property. So when we say that something has a certain property, we are saying that it is part of a certain category. Thus, when we say Socrates is mortal, we are saying that Socrates has the property of being mortal, which means that Socrates belongs to the category mortal things. Note that if this diagram was perfect, there would be many more things inside the category mortal things. Remember, terms themselves are neither true or false. However, terms can be vague or ambiguous. As is often the case with language, terms can be imprecise, unclear, or confusing. We need to be especially wary of this when we do logic, since we aim for our study to be exactly the opposite. One feature that demands close attention is vagueness. A term, usually a predicate, is called vague if it has a particular borderline case where it is not clear whether it can be correctly predicated of a subject or not. In other words, a term is vague if it is unclear which things are members of the category it refers to. Some classic examples are words like bald, short, tall, beautiful, etc. We do not have a precise height after which we consider a person a member of the category tall, and before which we consider them a member of the category short. We do not have a precise number of hairs, say, after which we consider a person not bald, and before we consider them bald. Suppose that Socrates is balding. When would it be true to say that Socrates is bald? In other words, when is Socrates a member of the category bald things? Consider the famous example of a heap of sand. How many grains of sand does it take to form a heap? If we have a thousand grains of sand in a pile, we would probably call that a heap of sand. Let's say we start taking away grains of sand one by one. When is it no longer a heap? When there are only five, three, two grains of sand? This is an example of the vagueness of the word heap. Another problematic feature of certain words is ambiguity. A term is called ambiguous if it can have multiple meanings. In other words, a term is ambiguous if it can refer to multiple different categories. Consider the following words, bank, star, cold, ruler, each of them has more than one meaning. Bank could designate a category of all riverbanks, or it could designate the category of all financial institutions we call banks. Notice that in both of the categories, they are called banks, but they have different members. So which category are we referring to when we say bank or that is a bank? For example, star could refer to a category of celestial bodies we call stars, or to a category of actors famous enough that we call them stars. These terms need to be disambiguated. We need to specify which meaning we want to use in a logical context. Only when we know what the word refers to can we evaluate the truth of various sentences. The sentence, that bank is beautiful, when expressed by a speaker in a city with a beautiful river and terribly unappealing buildings, could be true instead of the beautiful river bank, but false instead of the financial institution. Let's turn to a few examples of vague and ambiguous terms. For variety, let's look at the word bald as it occurs in the following slightly silly context. My friend Andrew has a receding hairline. He has not lost all of his hair, but he has lost quite a bit of it. If Andrew found himself in a room with Tom Cruise, who has a full head of hair, the sentence Andrew is bald would appear true, but if he found himself in a room with John Malkovich, who is completely bald, it would appear false. Why is the same sentence true in the first case, but false in the second? Here's an example of ambiguity. What if I said, this cold is killing me? Suppose a speaker who had a terrible cold expresses the above sentence in a place below freezing temperatures. As before, without some further explanation, the meaning of the sentence is not completely clear. In other words, if we were friends with the speaker who expresses the sentence to us, we could reasonably ask if they mean that their illness is killing them or that the outside temperature is killing them. Sometimes syllogisms are unsound because of vague or ambiguous terms. This can happen even if the syllogism is valid and the premises are true. Consider the following argument, which we went over in the last lesson. Premise one, all famous actors are stars. Premise two, all stars are celestial bodies. Conclusion, all famous actors are celestial bodies. This argument uses two different meanings of the word star, one in each premise. This is an instance of ambiguity. 
The term star is ambiguous because it is used to refer to different categories in the world during the same syllogism. As either subjects or predicates, terms can have a couple of properties worth mentioning, vagueness and ambiguity. Evaluating whether terms are clear and unambiguous is crucial in deciding whether a proposition is true and whether a syllogism is sound. Using the properties we have learned, we can now characterize specific components and arguments from a logical perspective. We understand all of this through the language of members and categories. See you all next lesson.